Good morning, everybody. It is a cloudy day here in Dallas. I hope that you guys are doing good. Um, good morning to Miss Gustina, uh, Susan, Jan and Larry, Rick, Janet, Charlotte, Amy Sloan, Joe Loy, and Charlene. Um, good morning to all of you. Stacy, good morning. And others of you are popping on too. Um, our our group is great a great great group to be part of, and I'm very blessed by you guys this morning. All right, so I guess we are ready to get started. Everybody's ready to get started on their day. Good morning, Teresa. All right, so our first uh, reading today is. It is day 97 in Lion Bite. Um, oh, sorry, I just got hail in Dakota. I'm, I was afraid that was going to happen out here. Uh, it's looking pretty dark, and I heard some thunder a minute ago. All right, so day 97, Dive Into My Love is what this is titled, and it said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love, John 15, 9. Dive into the ocean of my love and by Jesus, your sa Savior and Lord, Lord and Savior. There is an encouragement today from the Lord to dive into the depths of his amazing love. Be inspired by him to acknowledge the truth that there is no end, no bottom, no edge or completion to God's ineffable love. See and know that it is truly unfathomable. Just as a free diver would take a series of deep breaths and then push under the surface of the ocean, determinedly pressing on to see how far they can go into the depths of the water, training themselves to hold their breath for long stretches of time, so today God invites you to dive deep into the vastness of his love. There is no end, I hear him say. There's no limit. Come deeper. God is drawing you into the deep cavernous volume of his affection and adoration. He is saying to you, be immersed and saturated in my love. Allow me to, ba to baptize you afresh in my love. Allow my love to flood you and surround you. Dive into my love today, my child. And here's what we're to receive. It says, imagine that you're in the ocean. Take a deep breath and intentionally confess with your mouth out loud, I am diving into your love today. In that moment, allow your spiritual senses to begin to feel the pressing of God's love tangibly on your body, surrounding you from the head, from your head to your feet. Begin to recognize what it feels like to be immersed in the waters of God's love. Prophetic Act If you are able, run yourself a full bath, and as you get into the water, make the same declaration. I am diving into your love today, God. Baptize me in your love. Allow yourself to become completely immersed in the bath water. And as you do, ask the Holy Spirit for a super sensitization to all the facets of his love. Ask for your eyes to be open to a new revelation of his love. Your skin to fill his complete surrounding of you and your ears to hear the sound of God's love for you. You know, last night, uh, a group from the church was able to go and see the movie Jesus Revolution. You guys need to see that if you have not seen it. Um, it just came out last week. It is a super great movie. It's worth, go, you know, taking the time to go. And there's a scene in there that is this very thing um, in that it was, somebody was being baptized and it's this moment where they just are like falling into the depths of the ocean. They're being baptized in the ocean and, um, and they just, it's like they keep falling further and further and further. And then, you know, the person just sees the light and just feels drawn to the light. Um, and then when, when he came up out of the water, you know, he was asked how he felt. And he was like, I feel alive. And that's exactly what God's love does for us, is it makes us feel alive. So much so that we are able then to go out into the world very boldly 
and profess his love because that's what we're called to share. We're called to share that love. Um, so, you know, it was such a beautiful picture. It was such a beautiful movie. And um, I hope that you'll get to go see it. And, and when you see that scene, when you go, or those of you, because several of you that are here on the morning devotional this morning were at that movie with us last night. Um, and just think about that moment and think about this, this passage in this book, just this overwhelming love of God that absolutely surrounds you and just puts pressure all around you, like making you feel safe making you feel secure. And then when you, and then think about your own baptism. Think about what that was like when you came up out of the water. Um, you know, I, I had a moment where I felt different. I felt alive and I knew that it was a Holy Spirit moment. It was more than just being dunked in water. So, um, I just want to encourage you in that and um and 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 just feel the love. And if you get a chance, go see that movie because it will it will really get you thinking about your faith and about God's love and about what our call is as God's people. Oh Lord, let our souls rise up to meet you just as the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. And amen. All right, our first reading today in Leviticus, I know you're going to be really disappointed, but it's very, very short. And there's really not a lot to say about it. Um, so I'm just going to read it. And um, what it basically is saying is that there are different seasons of the year, uh, different um, celebrations that happened. And we're going to be reading about some of those in Leviticus. And um, basically, the this the first few verses of this, this introduction to these different festivals and different celebrations, is just an opportunity for us to think about, you know, how do we celebrate? What's important to us? And how whatever it is that we celebrate, that is what is meaningful to us, you know? I mean, that are, that's the fruit of what's, what is in our hearts. So the Lord said to Moses, and this is starting in verse 1 of 23, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, which you are to proclaim as official days for holy assembly. You have six days each week from your ordinary week, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day for complete rest, an official day for holy assembly. It is the Lord's Sabbath day, and it must be observed wherever you live. In addition to the Sabbath, these are the Lord's appointed festivals, the official days for Holy Assembly that are to be celebrated at their proper times each year. And then we'll go on here in the days ahead and we'll be reading about some of these different festivals. Um, I do want to just point out that the Sabbath, um, you know, I had an opportunity uh, Sunday to just have a Sabbath. And I, I, um, I felt a little guilty because normally Sundays, you know, that's a work day for me. And then normally I um, will take the afternoon and I will work, go to Tai Chi, you know, that kind of thing. But this Sunday I was just feeling really tired and, and really um, exhausted from the last couple of weeks that have been pretty intense. And so I just went home and I did nothing. And it was so awesome. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're not taking Sabbaths on some day during the week or some period of time, um, I want to encourage you to do that. And it's going to be my goal to do that too, um, whether it be on Monday or Sunday afternoon or whatever it will be. All right, let's go over to uh, Hosea chapter 10, starting in verse 1. And we're going to read eight verses. It says, how prosperous Israel is, a, a luxuriant vine loaded with fruit. But the richer the people get, the more pagan altars they build, the more bountiful their harvest, the more beautiful their sacred pillars. The hearts of the people are fickle. They are guilty and must be punished. The Lord will break down their altars and smash their sacred pillars. Then they will say, we have no king because we didn't fear the Lord. But even if we had a king, what good, what could he do for us anyway? They spout empty words and make covenants they don't intend to keep. So injustice springs up among them like poisonous weeds in a farmer's field. 
The people of Samaria tremble in fear for what might happen to their calf idol at Beth Avon. The people mourn and the priests wail because its glory will be stripped away. This idol will be carted away to Assyria, a gift to the great king there. Ephraim will be ridiculed and Israel will be shamed because its people have trusted this idol. Samaria and its king will be cut off and they will float away like driftwood on an ocean wave. And the pagan shrines of Avon, the place of Israel's sin, will crumble. Thorns and thistles will grow up around the altars, and they will beg the mountain, bury us, and plead with the hills, fall on us. Okay, so Israel prospered under Jeroboam II, and they just got wealthier. They built their armies. They were very, very strong. You know, we in the United States can relate to this. We've had times when things have been very strong economically, where where we've had a strong military, where we have felt like in some ways we were our own God, right? Because we could protect ourselves, we could provide for ourselves and all of that. Well, you know, there does come a time when um, the um, hand of the Lord, I think, gets lifted. And the reason is, is because what do we need him for if we think that we can handle it ourselves and he gives us the opportunity to realize that we really do need him that we can't do it on our own and um, we go through all kinds of, of periods of time and hopefully in those times when things seem to dry up for one reason or another that we realize once again that we need God and that we need to go and we need to bow before him and we need to admit what we have done. And we can do that on a personal level. We can do that on a national level. Um, but the people of Israel and in, in their community, they had together grown very strong and as a result had drifted away. It's like it says here, the hearts of the people are fickle. They are guilty and must be punished. The Lord will break down their altars and smash their sacred pillars. Because there is to be no other God besides the one true God. We can't look to our military. We can't look to our government. We can't look to ourselves to provide. Because everything that we have is because God has provided it first. I mean, that that it's his. Every bit of it's his. And we will be so much better off when we realize that than when we start thinking that it's all about us. And that it's all because we have done something right or we have, have um, created something um, and it's, it's our doing. Then we start getting into the same place where the Israelites are. Um, it talks about Beth Avon, and we've seen that word uh, mentioned several different times. This means house of wickedness, and it was a place um, that false worship took place, and um, we see that here with the calf idol at Beth Avon. Um, the people mourn and the priest will because its glory will be stripped away. So, you know, we see that destruction of those idols. Um, we also see that, I think, in our own life. When we, um, when we get so dependent upon things and then something happens and suddenly we don't have all the money in the bank that we had or we don't have our, our retirement to the extent that we did years ago. Um, whatever it may be, we realize we need the Lord. So, um, I encourage us today to look to the Lord always, whether in, in good times or in bad, to be, be content and to know, um, that God is the one who provides. And when we get really prosperous to not use that as an opportunity to drift away, but it's so easy to do. I have said before that some of the happiest, most spiritual people I know are the people who have to rely on the Lord the most. The ones who who are um, sometimes so distant are the ones who have plenty, um, who, who uh, do everything in their might to be able to preserve it, and that really get haughty in thinking that it's because of something they did. All right, let's turn over to um, chapter 11 in Luke, starting in verse 14. 
It says, one day Jesus cast out a demon from a man who couldn't speak, and when the demon was gone, the man began to speak. The crowds were amazed, but some of them said, no wonder he can, tr he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Others tried to test Jesus. De uh, Others trying to test Jesus demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. He knew their thoughts, and so he said, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A family splintered by feuding will fall apart. You say I am empowered by Satan, but if Satan is divided and fighting against himself, how can this kingdom survive? And if I am empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too, so they will condemn you for what you have said. But if I am casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For when a strong man like Satan is fully armed and guards his palace, his possessions are safe until someone even stronger attacks and overpowers him, strips him of his weapons, and carries off his belongings. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert, searching for rest. But when it finds none, it says, I will return to the person I came from. And so it returns and finds that its former ho home is all swept in an order. And then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. All right, so... Jesus was accused of casting out demons by the power of Satan, and Jesus is, is um, ought, he's defending himself, basically saying that's ridiculous to, to say that, that that doesn't even make sense, because then Satan's own kingdom would be divided. But he says here, um, for when a strong man, this is in verse 21, for when a strong man like Satan is fully armed and guards his palace, his possessions are safe until someone even stronger attacks and overpowers him, strips him of his weapons and carries off his belongings. Now, if we turn over to Isaiah 49 verses 24 through 26, uh, this may be referring to this. It says, can snatch the plunder of war from the hands of a warrior? Who can demand that a tyrant let his captives go? But the Lord says the captives of warriors will be released and the plunder of tyrants will be retrieved. For I will fight those who fight you and I will save your children. I will feed your enemies with their own flesh. They will be drunk with rivers of their own blood and the world will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer the mighty one of Israel. So it's basically talking about how God is so much more powerful than Satan. That's very encouraging to us because um, when we start thinking about how often um, Satan tries to get in and he, he uses other people that are vulnerable, other people that are willing to be used because they are not submitted to the Lord, um, then we, we, we sometimes feel overpowered. We sometimes feel overwhelmed by that. But when the, the Spirit of God is in us, then the Spirit of God is much more powerful than anything that the enemy can bring against us. And so we look at this in Isaiah um, chapter 49, verses 24 through 26, and we see that God is the one who's going to take care of our enemies. And that gives us a sense of security and a sense of peace that we don't fight our own battles, that God is the one who fights that the battle for us. And he's the one that has victory because his power is greater than the enemy. Um, and then also it goes on and it talks about um, the, um, the evil spirit leaving a person and then coming back with a vengeance. Um, and basically what that's saying is that our reformation, you know, when we reform, when we are reformed in our behavior, um, that it sometimes doesn't last long. And we've seen that, right? We've seen um, when maybe we've experienced it in ourselves, maybe we've seen it in other people where, you know, they're on fire for the Lord. 
And if they don't stay on that path of discipleship, and if we don't help them by discipling them, then that that change can be temporary because the enemy will try to return. And if there's, there is not a spiritual discipline and a spiritual practice in play, if they're not being surrounded by prayer, um, then they are vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. I've seen that happen multiple times when people give their hearts to the Lord and they're baptized. And then it's like it, they come back around. That's why I'm praying for Erica and Connie. And we all need to be praying for them because they've just been on a spiritual journey, a spiritual walk. And um, the enemy is going to be alive and well and and uh, attempting to come after them because they've just had a, an experience with God that was life changing. And so we as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have an obligation to cover them in prayer. And to surround them and to encourage them and to 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 um, help them because and we've all had people like that around us too, right? That when we've gone through times of transformation, when we've we've made a decision, to, a, a commitment to follow the Lord, the enemy's gonna come back with a vengeance because the enemy doesn't want to lose this battle. He wants us away from the Lord. And so, so please remember to pray for Connie and Erica and the others that were with them on this journey as well. All right. So that brings us to our prayer time and that that's a prayer request. Um, also, um, we are praying for Leslie. I, I, um, I haven't seen Leslie pop on this morning. Um, but I am hoping that her knee is doing okay. But we're going to pray for her. Um, we're also, let's please continue to pray for Gary Totch. His father's funeral will be Saturday. Um, and so we want to we wanna pray for him. And pray for his wife, Charlotte, as well. Because she's taking care of her elderly father as well. Um, we continue to pray for Open Arms Sober Living. Um, uh, we want to continue to pray for our MOPS group, and um, we want to continue to pray for opportunities where we can be um, in alignment with the Lord, where we can be uh, like-minded with Him and His mission and, and on track with His mission for this congregation, for the congregation and more, for the congregation in uh, burn it. And I do want to mention this um, while we're, before we go to the Lord in prayer, that um, Teresa, who is at First Christian Church, burn it. She's been doing uh, Lent at 11 every day. And so um, I want to encourage you to join in with her. Um, she, she goes to a different spot in the church or a different spot around the church grounds and and, and she's leading a little lesson throughout Lent. And so um, I just want to encourage you to check her out on our Facebook page. She goes live at 11. Um, also, um, this morning we have our last, and, and this evening we have our last study group until after Easter. And um, we are going to be doing a, a study after Easter, like about maybe the third week is when we'll start it in April. And um, it's going to be, a, it's an older book that has a newer uh, addition to it. it um, it's been revised, but it's Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. It's about the Holy Spirit. And I think it will be a great one while we're in the season of Easter headed towards Pentecost. And, um, so I want to encourage you to, uh, be thinking about, uh, that study and we'll be reading that book together. And, um, then we'll be, look, we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit and I'm super excited about that. Oh Lord, we praise you and thank you today for your presence with us. We thank you for your spirit that guides us throughout the day. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, by whom we are given a fresh new start. We are given strength for the day. We are given the, the assurance that we have been forgiven of our sins and that our sins have been not only forgiven, but forgotten. They've been cast out as far as the East is from the West. 
Lord, we pray that in knowing this, that we may walk confidently in this day, giving you glory and showing love to you in every way possible through the words that we speak, through the actions that we take, through the time that we set aside to just be in your presence. We pray today, Lord, as you guide us, that we may draw closer to you, that we may um, be given more of the vision that you would have for us, the more of that purpose that you have created us for, that we may we may walk in that, not waste time doing other things or getting caught up in the things of this world that are so tempting to get caught up in. Help us to be very realistic about um, what we have and and who it belongs to, remembering that all things belong to you and that you have blessed us so that we can bless others, so we can bless you. It's not so we can have more, so that we can be more comfortable, so that we can live in luxury, but help us, Lord, instead to remember why we were put here. Father, we pray that you will forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our pride, forgive us when we fail to surrender our lives to you. We pray, Lord, that you will give us strength for the day, that you will um, surround us with your love and that you will help us to feel that love, that being immersed in your love and being safe and being empowered. We pray today, Lord, for those who are struggling with health issues, those who are living with depression, those who are on a spiritual journey who may be struggling with their faith and even, even their belief in you. We pray, Lord, that you will, um, that your love will overflow upon them and that they will know the truth about you. And Father, I pray for Erica and Connie and on this spiritual journey, I pray a hedge of protection around them. I pray, Lord, that the passion and the enthusiasm that they had for you a few days ago will continue and will strengthen, that they will have great momentum in this area. And for us, Lord, as your various congregations in your body of Christ, we pray that you will give us an expansion of our territory, be it spiritual physical, um, emotional expansion of our territory so that we may glorify you in even greater ways. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to have favor with those in our community so that we're able to get in and share your message. We pray, Lord, that people will take notice as we, uh, as we shine um, brightly with your light by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hear us now, O Lord, as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, we are grateful that you use every experience to draw us closer to you. Our trials and triumphs alike can finally be sown into the garden of our faith. Amen. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may lead you today. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he will show you. May he bring you home rejoicing right back here in the morning. Until then, everyone, have a beautiful day. Stay safe out there, and I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow if I don't see you before then. Take care.